Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. We are all here for the International Day of Permafrost. We're going to load into our next three speakers, which the first one is um, Margarita Johnson from Interact. Then we have Cecile Pelé from Permos or Permos and Sabrina Muzaffari, Adventure of Science. I think we're going to take two speakers and do some questions and then we'll take the third speaker and do questions so that might give some more time to kind of think directly about those speakers thank you very much and uh, greetings oh you, yeah you can see me greetings from sweden everyone uh, a sunny day in southern sweden always a nice time so why am i here i'm here to talk about interact and of course why should we care mm, i think uh, Everyone that has been doing field work outside in rough terrain and then in the afternoon, evening, it's so nice to get back into a nice cozy ho house and get some, you know, be able to take a shower or whatever. And that is what field stations is all about. So Interact is a network of field stations. Okay, so Interact is a network of terrestrial research stations. Uh, at the end of 2021, we were 90 research stations in the network uh, in all Arctic countries, as you can see on the left-hand side. Then there was a little war started, unfortunately, and with that, we also lost quite a few stations. Uh, we are pausing all the collaboration with the Russian research stations at the moment, and we now have a network of 69 research stations in the seven Arctic uh, countries, excluding Russia at the moment. Uh, you can learn more about the research stations on our website. We have got a station catalog that you can go through and look at. And we also have a, a card game that you can play in the evenings at the research stations when you are bored and you will learn all about the research stations. Uh, in addition, we have an Interact GIS where you can learn about the research and monitoring that is ongoing at the different sites. Um, I think the main thing for, for you guys is that we are actually providing something called transnational access. This is that you can come to a research station and get the travel and accommodation for free. So you apply to go to a research station, you go to the research, you know, the station catalog and look for a research station that you think might fit your needs. And then you apply to go there and you will have free access to this station. We have an annual call, uh, so then you can apply to go but you're not allowed to apply to go to your own country. That is, it has to be transnational to another country. In addition to this transnational access, we also have something called remote access. And this is when the staff at the research station is doing the, the, the work for you. Uh, so if it is a simple setup, then I think this is a much better alternative. During COVID, it has been amazing because we have been able to do some research also during COVID, thanks to the staff at the research stations being there all year round. And of course, it's also an environmental friendly way of doing research. Uh, and an output of those transnational and remote access, uh, there is a lot of research that has been ongoing. You can read about it in the stories of Arctic science. It's on our website. Uh, and we also have an ebook uh, as a version of this stories of Arctic science, including a lot of educational materials. In addition, we are of course using social media and we have a blog site, uh, etc. So there is a lot of information to, to get. There is also something called virtual access. So if you're interested in data from the Arctic, then this website is actually providing real data um, uh, links to real data from several research stations and you can just download it. And as I said, it's a network of research stations and we want to make sure that they are as good as possible. When you guys will come and visit, we have to make sure that they are as best as they can be, and that we can do by learning from each other and then compiling that information into guidebooks. So as you can see, we have produced quite many guidebooks uh, and, and, um, yeah, and field guides, etc. We are also having a two, a, as I said, we have the Interact GIS, and this you can use, you can, there is, for example, a permafrost um, uh, layer that you can put on and then you can see what stations are within the different permafrost zones etc. Uh, we have also compiled information about Arctic permit systems because when you need go to another country there are quite many permits that you might require that might be required and then this 
website uh, provides you an overview. So that is quite helpful if you're going to do field work. Um, we are working on specific tasks uh, or th themes as well, and one of them are extreme weather events. Uh, and this is, as you know, very difficult to predict, but with the help of the data from the interact stations and the ECMWF in UK, we are trying to look at what is requested, what is it that we are lacking to get an improve, um, improved uh, forecast for these extreme weather events. Um, we're also working with industry, especially with the uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, and I think it might, many of you might do those um, uh, hand, you know, you're in the field, you're typing, you're writing your notes, and we are using uh, AI to automatically digitize those um, notebooks uh, and see how it works and then uh, use the best possible algorithms to do those. And that is available, this information, how to do that if you want to save some time. And then of course, uh, also uh, another application is for use to identify things in camera, uh, in, in photos. Uh, we're also working with the Arctic uh, Monitoring and Assessment Program, AMAP, uh, to document and reduce the pollutions around the research stations. Even though they are far away, some of them in the Arctic, they are still exposed to pollution. So uh, how can we um, monitor the, this pollution and try to decrease it, of course? And then we are also working with indigenous peoples, especially the Sami people in, in, in Scandinavia, uh, where they are developing uh, guidelines for tourists. I mean, Arctic is obviously increasing. Tourists, la, 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 la. number of tourists visiting the Arctic are increasing. And hence, how can we make sure that they, it is uh, so sustainable as possible. And this is a collaboration with the indigenous peoples, indigenous local people, as well as with the research stations and how can we combine that uh, knowledge so that we can make it as sustainable as possible. Uh, so that's another thing we're working on as well. And then last but not least, we are working, we have produced a lot of educational material. We have a network of over 2,000 teachers in, uh, no, I don't remember, 50, 60 countries, can't remember, around about 50, 60 countries, um, that, um, that have requested some specific uh, educational material that we have then responded to. And uh, you can find everything on our website, especially from this uh, e-book that I was talking about before. And then you have one example down here where you can explore treasures in permafrost and you can use the spade and then you can dig and get find some things in the permafrost or you can use the binocular to look at things and things like that. So we hope that this is very helpful for um, schools and they have at least told us that they are appreciate this. Okay, I'm rambling on here, but I'm now coming to my final slide. If you want to know more about Interact, please visit our website or our Facebook page or Twitter or, 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 or uh, now I, Instagram. Sorry, my brain died for a moment. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Perfect. So I'm joining from Switzerland, <laughs> from my home in Switzerland. And uh, today I'm going to talk about the Swiss Permafrost Monitoring Network, or PERMOS, and talk to you a bit about the general structure and a few key results. So on this first slide, you can see that uh, PERMOS is not only me, or my colleague Janet Nutzi is also in the PERMOS office, but it's all these institutions that are, have their logo here. And the way it started in PERMOS, some history to start with. So. The measurements about uh, mountain permafrost in Switzerland, they started in the, 50, the 70s uh, with some uh, study from Eberle or Bosch. And then, but the first real start of uh, monitoring measurement was in 1987 with the first drilling for permafrost monitoring, dedicated for permafrost monitoring on the Rock Glacier Motel. And then since then, start uh, things started to, to grow. And then we have the, the this very famous PACE uh, European project where two more drillings took place in the 2000 or 1998. And then this led actually to a first concept of a national permafrost monitoring network, PERMOS, which was actually officially created in the 2000s. And then from then on, um, there was a few events notable uh, amongst the, those, the, 
the adoption of permafrost as an ECV by the GICOS and the, actually the forming of GTNP. For us, there was also the formalization of the network by the, um, the actually the government who is actually financing us. That was in 2007. And then the data management system was actually established within a research project and still continues. And now we have a very nice agreement with all the partner institutions and the, the confederation who's actually financing us. And the way PERMOS is organized, so we have these two kinds of partners. We have federal partners who are mostly financially supporting us and the partner institution, which are actually doing the measurement and doing the science. And uh, we have then an executive office, which is uh, responsible for the network coordination, management, data management, reporting and everything. And then the, the way it, it's uh, supported by these partners, we have a steering committee, which is representative of each institutions, which actually guides the general strategy of the network. And we have a more scientific committee, which actually discusses uh, the results, um, discusses the new integration of new sites, new methods, and all these things that are actually evolving during uh, the permafrost monitoring, the duration of the project. And from PERMOS, we are in contact with uh, some national organizations. So that's in Switzerland, that's uh, AKK. It's coordinating the national uh, cryosphere monitoring program, but we are also involved heavily in GTNP and other uh, associations like the IP action groups and such. And the, this whole part is actually dedicated to research, but there's a big chunk of work that is actually also um, if, dedicated to uh, data communication and um, for, for more general public. And then what we actually do in PERMOS, so that's all this task for permafrost monitoring. I'm quite sure everyone in the call knows what it's like. So that first you have to install the installation, but you have to plan to evaluate the sites, and then you have to do the measurements usually in harsh conditions, uh, quite difficult. You have to then process the raw data, uh, access, uh, download them, process, pre-process them, quality control, quality check, archive, and then finally the, the reporting and the final analysis. And the way it works in our, in our networks, so the first part is done more by the principal investigators, which are mostly in the, the different partner universities and institutions, and then the last bit is done by the network management, which is the office where I'm working at. And then the goal is actually the long term documentation of uh, state and changes of permafrost in the Swiss Alps. And since uh, the Swiss Alps, it's uh, compared to Canada is relatively small, but for us, it seems very big and also very diverse in terms of where we observe permafrost. So these are just a few examples of the environment we are faced, we are facing. So we need um, a monitoring strategy that can account for all of this. So that's why we selected a landform based monitoring strategy and not um, um, region based uh, strategy. And what we are actually doing or how we are actually monitoring permafrost. First and foremost, we are basing our um, monitoring on uh, ground observation of uh, ground temperature in boreholes. Here, just a few uh, picture. And then accompanying that to have a special representativity of this borehole, we have uh, quite a few uh, ground surface temperature loggers, which are measuring continually temperature just at the surface. Um, of the ground. And then in addition to that, we included uh, geological measurements to actually measure, uh, to account for ground ice melt or changes that cannot be captured by uh, temperature in the boreholes. And finally, we are also measuring uh, creep velocity on the rock glaciers, since it's an indirect indicator of uh, how permafrost is behaving. And all of this, it actually didn't happen at once. It's, uh, ah, sorry. And then we also have some meteorological parameter to, to further our analysis. And as I was saying, this didn't happen at once. It started in 2000s with really the ground temperature. And then we included a bit later the, the geoelectrics, afterwards the kinematics, and very recently some colors, some more uh, measurements. And then, Finally, this is how it looks like in our Permos network. So it's in total 
I'm not even sure. I think it's 24 sites with very different uh, instrumentation. Some are only kinematics, some have temperature kinematics. So we try to, to measure as much as possible different landforms in different topochromatic context. And what we actually observed, that's just a few key results. So this is just a graph to show in which condition we are here in uh, in Switzerland. So that's a uh, air temperature anomaly measured at one of the official Meteo Swiss station. I just highlighted the start of Permos in 2000, and you can see the past 20 years have been the warmest ever measured. And uh, the, there's an increased warming in the last years. And what happened in the ground in terms of uh, permafrost temperature, we have an increase everywhere. And it's in the order of magnitude of about plus 0 0.5 degrees in 20 years at 20 meters depth. So it's not near the surface. So it's very consequential. If you look at the electrical resistivity or here more the electrical conductivity so that the evolution is the same in every graph, um, we have a decrease in the resistivity or an increase in conductivity, which actually is indicative of a loss of ground ice of, or an increase of liquid water within the permafrost. This is also taken at depth, not near the surface, but really at depth of permafrost. And finally, we have a general increase of rock glacier velocity which also follows very nicely the, the ground temperature. So you see large interannual variability that corresponds to the same uh, variability in the permafrost temperature. And all of these measurements, so all of this is actually very consistent and show a trend of permafrost warming and degradation in the Swiss Alps. All of this is freely available. So we are trying to have an open data policy. We try to, to, to really work on our communication. So for that, we have yearly online report, which is the Swiss Permafrost Bulletin. Since three years, we are publishing this. We have four years printed reports, which is called Permafrost in Switzerland that started this publication in the 2000s. And then we also publish uh, our data under a DOI. So every year together with the Bulletin, we publish it. And all of this is actually openly available on our uh, newly renewed website, uh, permos.ch, uh, where you can you have also access to a very nice data portal where all the data are uh, visible and you can download them. So, and of course, this is a uh, work of 20 years and uh, more than 20 people. So that's just a few pictures of who was and still is involved. And I think there are many more to come and I thank them all, as well as you, for your attention for this talk. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much, Cecil and Margarita. Maybe we can spotlight Margarita as well. That's great. So please use the chat to ask your questions. I know um, that we are all on mute. So <laughs> there is one question. And that is for Cecile. What is permafrost kinematics? <laughs> Sorry, so that's maybe a shortcut. It's actually not permafrost kinematics. It's we we talk about rock glacier kinematics. So rock glacier are these typical permafrost landforms. We have a mixture of ice and ground, and they are actually creeping. Uh, under the effect of ice deformation and also um, internal um, shearing, and what we've seen the past. Uh, last 10, 20 years with the data is that uh, the, this, the, the, the kinematics or the velocity of these landforms, they, you can actually relate that, that to the evolution of the permafrost temperature. So that's what we, we say when we talk about uh, uh, rock glacier creep velocity or rock glacier kinematics. Yeah, um, Cecile, there is a question in the chat before you um, give your final words. It says, along with velocity and temperature, are you considering other properties like slope and other subsurface parameters on the rock glaciers? Yeah, um, I mean, the, the that's actually um, a work that is still ongoing. There's an IPA action group dedicated to rock glacier inventories and kinematics where we're actually exploring this topic. So if you want to learn more, feel free to join it. But we, we are also, of course, every rock glacier is a bit different and it uh, the slope has an impact on the on the, the absolute velocity. But what we are mostly interested in is actually the, 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 the changes in this velocity. So the, 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 the context in which the, the rock glacier are usually set will define the, the absolute velocity or 
the, uh, the general velocity of the landform, but then the interannual evolution is mostly due to what changes on an interannual basis, which is often related to, to temperature. We are also exploring the role of water. That's a very big topic, which is still quite poorly understood at the moment. So it's very interesting, and uh, there's a lot of interesting research going on on the subject. And um, I don't know, you asked for, for, for final words. So what I showed is uh, 20 years in the making. It's it's a lot of work and it's a lot of people and it's a lot of, of investment. So we are always, um, and it's it's growing and growing because the, the, the amount of data we are collecting is growing and growing. And I, I would really always strengthen the importance of monitoring for I mean, for everyone, it's the basis of everything we do in research in science. So I, for us, it's it's uh, it's always very nice to have these kind of uh, meetings where you can present our work because uh, then you also see the importance of what we are doing and the support. Yeah. No, I just want to encourage everyone to please visit our website and contact us if you have any questions, because, of course, we we are eager to see more uh, permafrost research going on at the research station. So um. now we're going to bring up Sabrina Mizafari from Adventures of Science. Um, hello, everybody. I'm joining from the Pamir Mountains in Tajikistan, and I'm here to talk about how a scientific communication program, Adventure of Science, Women and Glaciers in Central Asia empowers young women from Central Asia to pursue their interest in science. So basically to monitor the permafrost and the glaciers, we need the scientists. And here is what our program is trying to do to encourage the females in Central Asia to become scientists. So what is Adventure of Science? Uh, it is a tuition-free glaciological expedition. It's a 10 day long expedition um, for the females of Central Asian countries. Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan. It was found uh, by Marlene Barandun and uh, uh, Martina Barandun and Marlene Kronbeck. Uh, it is part of the bigger um, international organization, which is Inspiring Girls Expeditions, more like a program. Um, they have many umbrella branches in Alaska and Austria and uh, Canada. And we are one of them in Central Asia. So what are we? We're just five years old, um, kind of proud that we lasted uh, so long. The first expedition was in 2019, and I am uh, the participant of the very first expedition. Then we had two at-home programs because of the COVID. We could not go uh, into the field. And then last uh, summer in 2022, we had our finally second expedition in al National Park, Kyrgyzstan. And we are planning now our third expedition to be held this summer. Who are the participants? So as I've mentioned, they are the girls from Central Asia. Um, there are 10, two from the Central Asian country, 18 to 25 years old. Um, their scientific interest and their interest in general is very different. Some of them study science, some of them don't. Some of them are artists, some of them are mountaineers, some of them just doing something else completely non-related to science. Uh, so the diversity of the participants is very important to us their interests, their cultural background, socioeconomic background, and thematic interest. It is everything that we consider when we're choosing our participants because in diversity is power. So what defines adventure of science? First of all, uh, we provide a safe space. First of all, we do our best to provide a safe space for uh, the girls. Um, and it is an all female team that we're working with. Here is our team. It is one mountain guide, usually from Kyrgyzstan, six instructors. Um, half of the team is from uh, Switzerland and half is from Central Asia. This is us. Uh, next, it is teaching in environmental and environmental science and glaciology. What do we teach? We teach, we have models on glaciology, geomorphology, hydrology, climate change. 
And we also try to uh, incorporate some art into what we teach. And we want the, our participants to maybe explain uh, science through art and uh, have some creativity into how they approach science and um, explain science, perhaps. Um, how we teach it is in the field so it is a hands-on experience and teaching inquiry based so we try to make them ask questions and be curious and uh, just uh, explore whatever they can uh, we have open discussions every day uh, where people uh, where our participants and our instructors um, share their observations throughout uh, the day and maybe if they have noticed something interesting, we all try to explain why, for example, uh, around the rock, there is no snow and it melted while everywhere else uh, there is snow. Something perhaps sometimes basic, but sometimes very big too. Um, the program is centered, uh, the final project, the final outcome is for the participants to create a research project themselves. So they plan and realize their project under the supervision of the instructors, of course. They uh, formulate their hypothesis, whatever they're interested in, be it biology, be it hydrology, or climate, or perhaps art. Um, and then they present their findings on the public event, uh, which is happening right after the 10-day expedition. Here is how the public event looks. We invite, uh, um, it happens in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, and we invite uh, whoever wants to join, be it uh, the scientists, local scientists, or um, just students and youth to uh, come and listen to what our participants have found and experienced. Next, it is acquisition of outdoor skills. Um, so that you know, it is not quite typical for a Central Asian uh, girl to go hiking, to go do mountaineering, especially, uh, well, to different extent in different Central Asian countries, but in Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, and especially Turkmenistan, girls don't really uh, go hiking uh, and don't really get into this uh, alpinism and mountaineering. And that's what we try to um, show them that it is completely normal and they are strong enough to do that and they have all whatever is needed uh, to go into the mountains and explore, which is why we, um, our expedition is in the field and we teach them some mountaineering uh, um, basics as well. Next, it is the post-expedition mentorship program. Um, so we don't say goodbye to our participants right after, right after the end of uh, the expedition. We still stay in touch with them. And if they need any help from us or guidance, guidance in terms of where to apply perhaps for bachelor or master's, or if they want to have an internship and they need recommendation letters um, and et cetera, we're always there to guide them. So what are the goals of Adventure of Science? First of all, I guess it is clear that it is to empower young women through science and wilderness exploration to show them that they're enough and that they can. Next is to support young women to proceed uh, environmental uh, um, courses and science. Um, because at the moment, uh, the gender gap in academia of the, especially the STEM field is huge. There are much more uh, males, uh, men um, in the uh, area, uh, in this field than females, and we are trying to change that through our program. And finally, it is encouraging na national universities to include young female scientists into their uh, academic activities because um, not only it is male dominated, but it is, uh, it higher, it all, well, male dominated, I guess it says everything. So we're trying to encourage them to hire uh, and include more females into their work. Some of our long-term goals are involvement of female scientists from uh, Central, Asian, uh, Central Asian countries as instructors um, and do mountaineering. Uh, so as I am one of the um, Central Asian participants, they later invited me to uh, also organize, help in organizing the program, which means that they won. We tried to shift uh, the, all of the organization to Central Asian uh, um, specialists. 
So it means that to involve uh, motivated past participants into the program. Uh, finally, it is partnership and collaboration with local universities and institutions for the project to be anchored and to be sustainable. Uh, and the main one is to create a network of female scientists throughout the whole Central Asia uh, who support, mentor, and encourage the next generation of researchers. Go and monitor the permafrost and um, do science. Thanks a lot for your attention. And of course, we wouldn't be able to do it a lot alone. So here are some of our sponsors that have supported us throughout the five years of uh, our functioning. Oh, are there any participants from Turkmenistan that joined your events? I hope that somebody would ask a similar question. Question, thanks a lot, Albina. Um, we had some applicants from Turkmenistan uh, and we always do uh, invite them to the program, but unfortunately due to the uh, political regime that is there at the moment, they're never able to join which is uh, a big loss to our program and to all um, Central Asia and um, the science here, scientific community. But we are always very hopeful and uh, looking forward to see them being part of our program. So we advertise our program through different means. As we said, we have a network of institutions we're working with within Central Asia. So we do um, ask them to promote our program and advertise it among their network. Then we also have our social media and the website where we uh, post very frequently and actively to keep um, the young uh, females engaged and uh, interested in our program. I will then later share the links to our Instagram and Facebook and the website. If anybody is interested, you're more than, one more than welcome to give it a look, to have a look at that. Yeah, I guess my final word would be to continue with the uh, Albina's question as the political regime in Turkmenistan is not uh, that suitable for females to do science. It is becoming a bit more harder to have programs like Adventures of Science in other Central Asian countries as well. Like for example, due to um, the tensions between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, the Tajik participants unfortunately could not join the uh, program last summer and they had to stay. We tried to involve them into the uh, field work that was happening in Tajikistan, but it was not really the part of, it was not a full package, so to say. Um, so it is said that uh, politics is interfering into science and uh, education.